I saw this very handsome guy uh, wearing kind of a rough tweed jacket and a, a wool sweater. And when the movie was over, he stood up and he was wearing a skirt. And this was shocking for numerous reasons. One, he wasn't the skirt type of guy. Um, he looked really like a librarian in the skirt. Um, and, and also, it was illegal to wear women's clothes then. And so even the people who really wore them routinely, which that's the only time I ever saw that, they didn't do it in Midtown. You know, um, so that was my first uh, view of Peter. And I, I met him there. And I never saw the skirt again. But I did ask him, why were you wearing a skirt, Peter? And he said, because I, one day I thought, it's not fair. Women can wear pants. Why can't men wear skirts? And I thought, that's the thing you think isn't fair? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a long list, Peter. It's yes. a very long list. Did he, when you were, um, did you work with him at interview when you were? Uh, Peter? No. Oh, no. So he didn't, he was not, he didn't photograph any of the... Peter photographed me numerous times, possibly for interview once, although I don't remember that. Um, but uh, no, I did not work. I, I never actually thought having my picture taken was work. You know, the, mm. the people for whom getting your picture taken is work, you know, they're a different kind of girl. So, <laughs> so Peter had already uh, uh, published the Portraits in Life and Death at the time. No, that, no, no. Oh, no, that's No, later. because I'm in that. I'm, in oh. one, I'm, I'm one of the people alive. Um, <laughs> No, so he, he published that afterward. Um, I know that because I'm in it. Because you're in it, right? Yes. Um, but by the time I had met Peter, that book was already out. And actually, David Von Rovich's book, Sounds in the Distance, was already out. So these were two people who, I mean, were heroes to me. I mean, Peter was, as you said, everybody was in love with Peter. He was totally beautiful, absolutely looked up to by everyone. He was... A, he was 20 years older than David. Um, 17 years older than me. You know, I, rem I always remember that because it seemed like he was so old. You know, <laughs> so actually he must have been 20 when I met him because he was 37. And I thought, he's 37, this guy looks still good for his age. <laughs> <laughs> and it's odd that you bring up 37 because David Von Rovich was 30, so he only lived to be 37 years old. And uh, David was born in 1954. And he did one of the things before he met Peter, uh, you know, who has everything to do with David's success. He, uh, he had already done two, uh, two things. He had done the Rembo series where he took a uh, uh, portrait, one of the few portraits of Rembo, and had people wear them and photograph them all over New York. And uh, three teens kill four, I guess. And, you know, Rembo was born in... 1854 and lived to be 37. I didn't know him. I never met him. You never met him, right? And David was born 100 years later and lived to be 37. I thought that was a kind of odd thing. But in, in, li in listening to, to Fran and, and living through um, this period with David and, and Peter, um, you, talk a, you, you talk a little bit about how Peter... Um, and maybe you can talk some more about Peter didn't have the success that I thought that he had. I mean, I thought that he was like the most successful artist in the East Village. He lived in a loft. He knew what lots I thought of was a huge people. loft, right? I thought the first time I went there, I thought, wow. Uh, yes. You know, actually, I have no idea how big that loft was, but at the time, I thought, wow, it's fantastic. This loft he inherited, not inherited because he wasn't dead, but he acquired from Jackie Curtis. Um, and Jackie Curtis had that loft. I don't know how Jackie got a loft. I can't even imagine it. Mm. Um, I don't know how Jackie had even shoes. Um, but Jackie also had, you think an aunt, I think it was her grandmother. I think it was Jackie's grandmother. Uh, owned a bar across the street called Slugger Ann's. Uh -huh. um, you, Jackie was the sort of person who had either an aunt or a grandmother named Slugger Ann. Um, <laughs> this was not like my grandmother. Um, and at a certain point, Jackie couldn't, I guess, not pay for this loft. Um, and so she moved upstairs over Slugger Ann's, and Peter got the loft. So, you know, my, my impression was, I moved to New York in 1980. My impression was everybody who moved to New York in the 70s got a loft. It's like, you move to New York, you're an artist, we're going to give you a loft, and later there's going to be a loft law, and you're going to be able to live there for the rest of your life for yeah, $125. Yeah, they gave them out right at the tunnel when you came in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so... Peter, who, you know, as we all know now, seeing his work was an amazingly talented, incredibly talented artist, but not 
sold very little during his lifetime, but he did um, get involved with a lot of what can be termed as magical thinking. Well, Peter, Peter would think of reasons why he wasn't succeeding. Um, and they would be the, never the reasons why he wasn't succeeding. For instance, in Peter's mind, he, he wasn't not succeeding because he threatened to break a bar stool over a dealer's head. <laughs> he wasn't not succeeding because I believe he punched a, a woman dealer in the right. face. Um, this was not why he was not succeeding. He was not <laughs> succeeding because all successful people's first and last names started with the same letter. <laughs> this was a thing he was on for like a year. And every time he would see me, he would like tell you, Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> you know, now I can't remember the other names. Robert Rauschenberg, yes. Jasper Johns. Right, there would be, and, those, and that was the reason. So he, was, he would say, do you think I should change my name? And I would say, no, I think you should change your behavior. <laughs> you know? I think, you know, when the, I remember these two guys came from Paris. Um, t uh, I call them the twins. They were not twins. They were, in fact, boyfriends, which is a kind of twin, I suppose. Um, <laughs> because they looked exactly alike. There were these little muscly guys with shaved heads, very early shaved head guys. Um, and they were very nice. And they wanted to give Peter a show. And I said, Peter goes, these guys are horrible. They're trying to come over to my uh, loft all the time. I said, Peter, they're trying to give you a show. He said, they're horrible. I have to have lunch with them. Could you come? So I said, and they're taking you to lunch, which he needed, by the way. <laughs> so <clears throat> we went to lunch. They were perfectly nice. And that night, he went to some bar with him, and he threatened to break a bar stool over their heads, and consequently, they did not give him a show. But not because his name wasn't Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> but even, even though Peter couldn't figure out how, why he wasn't famous, I, I've heard that he liked to give people, to tell people what they should do. Like I know that with Gary Schneider and John Erdman, he said you have to start this, uh, you know, you're a really good printer, you're really, you know, you, you, uh, you're very good with negatives and, and developing and all this kind of stuff, and you should have a business. And so, you know, when Peter told you to do something, you did it. So, you know, they started this business, and in fact, it did work out okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Peter would, he, he had a way of telling people, you know, what they should do in order to be successful. He also, at one point, got into numerology, which those of you lucky enough never have heard of this, um, I can't give you an exact description because there is no such thing, um, but it has something to do with like the number of letters in your name, you know, what number were, was a good number to have, what was a bad number. Then he would give you many examples from history, you know, uh, George Washington had this many numbers, I don't, that's why I'm not George Washington. Um, uh, and that also lasted a long time. He was very vulnerable to every crackpot theory that came along, which was really surprising because he was very smart, Peter. But if you talked to him on a certain day, you would forget that he was very smart. <laughs> well, I, I actually fell into that. I did the numerology. I figured out my name. But then I, the, the, um, and I changed my name. I was not born Gracie Mansion. So then I thought, ah, oh, how does this affect uh, how does this affect me and, and who I am? And then, it, then I did, you know, I had to do my, you know, what the name I was born with, and then uh, I got married. So then how does that affect? For women, do they become a different, do they get a different number once they get married? I guess they do. Yes, half. And they become a different... <laughs> <laughs> that could be the only reason. <laughs> but I heard that Peter went through, uh, you know, maybe the problem is I'm not signing my... Prince, like, where should I sign my print? Should I sign them on the back? Should I sign them on the bottom right? Should I? It was always something either completely insane or totally inconsequential. Mm. You know, I mean, that's a very inconsequential thing. That I don't even recall, you know. Yeah. It, it was never anything real. Well, I, I did hear a rumor that he, that he did like me because I changed my name. I guess, you know, that was like, that, that was my big claim Because to he fame probably figured out the number or whatever and thought that was a good number. Yeah, and thought that was a good thing. Um, but Peter, in fact, did change his name one time, right? I'm trying to can look at my notes. He, he decided that one way he was going to make money was to um, sell porn uh, postcards. And he did, took an anagram of his name, and you, know, you, you, don't, you don't know this? I'm not remembering this, no. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can find this now. Um, uh, Kate... Tate, something like that was the first name. Um, That's a good point. Jute. Right? Jute Harper. He took the name Jute Harper. I do remember this name. I remember the name. <laughs> you know, 
This I it's forgot. It's a good name, isn't it? Jude Harper for porn star. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so he took, and that was like one time that he and David Von Rovich worked together. He, David posed for these pornographic um, shots that he, uh, that John Erdman was, uh, uh, took them out into industrial neighborhoods, and David posed, I guess, with somebody else, and that Peter was going to become very rich from these, of course. Of course he did not. Of course he did not. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, but, but David... Um, in fact, did have great success, and all because of Peter. I mean, David is, uh, David met Peter um, late 1979, early 1980 at the bar, just on 4th Street and 2nd Avenue, and um, it was, Peter immediately, it was, I guess for a very short time, it was a romantic relationship, but then it turned more into like a father, a brother, a best friend you know, um, sort of thing. And David, he, without Peter, there, we wouldn't be, probably might not be sitting here and, and, and talking about David. David up to that point was only a writer, but he did. Only a writer. Only a writer, yeah, sorry. <laughs> But he became so like much Proust? more. <laughs> um, but he did, supposedly did some kind of cartoon on the wall of Peter's loft, which, which, which Peter thought was the most genius thing that he had ever seen. And everybody that came over, he'd say, look at this. Do you remember this? I do. I also, when Peter started talking to me about David, I paid zero attention. Okay, because, you know, Peter, you know, would have these enthusiasms about boys that would last like three days, you know. Um, and I paid no attention also because he was in a band, uh, David, called Three Teens Kill Four, or Four Teens Kill Three, or? Yeah. No motive. Three yeah. Teens Kill Four, no motive. Ah. Um, yeah, it's a good idea anyway. It's a, um, <laughs> and uh, I just paid no attention, uh, you know, and then I met him and I paid no attention. Um, <laughs> and I just kept paying no attention to David. Um, and I didn't really pay attention to David until Peter got sick. You know, hmm. I mean, my relationship with David didn't really start until Peter got sick. I mean, I didn't dislike him. I just, and I also once remember, when in, I thought about this on my way here, um, after I'd met him several times, um, I was walking down the street and he said, hi, friend, and I just said hi, and he, I kept walking and he knew I, and I said, it's David. <laughs> and I'm thinking, which one, which <laughs> David? Um, but when Peter got sick, David and I became very close. I had a very close emotional relationship with David that was instantaneous, I mean instantaneous predicated on Peter being sick. You know, I mean he was, I mean we all were, but he was grief stricken. And mm. see, I always from that time on always thought of David as Peter's son. You know, he yeah. always seemed that way to me. Um, his emotional also because Peter planned his funeral um, and he d uh, decided, uh, I, I spent all the time Peter was being sick telling him he wasn't going to die. Um, and then Peter said, well, you know, in case I do die, you know, which of course everyone was dying that Vade's in, um, I want to have uh, a plain uh, casket, a plain pine casket, uh, like Orthodox Jews are buried in. Um, and that's very important. Uh, and you have to do this. And at that time, there was one funeral home in New York City that would agree to bury people who died of AIDS. No other funeral home would touch this, you know, and no one protested it, you know, and thought, well, of course, who would do this? Um, and that funeral home is on 14th Street. It's still there. Hmm. Um, and so he kept saying, you have to go and order this, and I like, couldn't do it. And David called and he said, I will go with you. This is you very know? nice. And so we went there, and I, but this is basically a Catholic funeral home. So I explained to the guy, um, you know, these plain pine coffins that Orthodox Jews are writing? Yes. Could you get one of these? Yes. Um, so he said, your friend is Jewish? I said, no. I said, he's, he said, is he Catholic? I said, he's crazy. <laughs> um, which is, you know, another definition of being Jewish or Catholic or any other religion. Um, but these coffins, in case you want to know this, have usually a Star of David carved into the top. So I said, and you have to take that off. <laughs> so he could, we cannot have that. Um, and they did it. They did every single thing. Um, but from the first day that we went there, I was so shattered, and David just said, let's just go to what we used to call co coffee shops, now they call them diners. 
and there was a, they were all incredibly filthy. It's amazing I'm alive, having eaten many meals in these places. Um, and we just went in there, we just like stayed there for like six or seven hours, and that really sealed my relationship with David. I think that David, you're right, I mean David, um, probably at one point was more like, was the son, but at that point he became the father. Um, well, kind of, but I mean, he, he was so... He had to take so care of every, I mean, he took care of a lot. Yeah, so he took you. care of things. You know, yes, um, that isn't always a definition of a father, but his, um, his uh, emotional response to Peter was not that he was taking care of him. You know, I mean, he was like a lost child, David, during oh. that. You know, one of the things David did was... Also, the other thing Peter wanted to do um, was he wanted to be buried in the specific cemetery, which is in Westchester. Um, it's a Catholic cemetery, because unbeknownst to me, uh, when Peter got sick, he started seeing a priest. I never knew this until like the very end. It's not the sort of thing you would tell me. Um, and he picked the cemetery, and I asked someone about it. They said, well, you know, that's like the most expensive, fanciest Catholic cemetery in the entire country. And that is where Peter wanted to be buried. So this was imperative. David paid. David paid for the plot, which you know you could buy a house. Um, and also Judy Garland was buried there. I think that might have been. But also many mafia chieftains. You know, <laughs> there were these huge mausoleums. You know, with like you know uh, the names of famous gangsters and their entire families. And, um, I thought, I wonder if Peter knows this. But <clears throat> um, David also uh, designed and uh, made the uh, um, gravestone. Mm -hmm. And it was very elaborate, it was not done in time, it took forever, and once Peter died, after the funeral, he, uh, David went up there all the time. And he was always calling me when he got back crying, they're not taking care of the grave, it's not, they're supposed to, you pay for this thing called perpetual care. Mm -hmm. Like there's such a thing as perpetual care. Um, and uh, they aren't doing it, and you have to call them, and um, then finally the stone came and they put it in the wrong place. And he was very focused on the physicality of this grave. Um, and I kept saying, stop going there. You can't go there all the time. But he kept going there. Well, David, he, you know, David had a sense that he was going to die really young. And in fact, he thought he would die before Peter, because he thought he would die before everybody that he knew, and not from AIDS, I mean, just, he had, he and Peter both, but David had a particularly uh, horrible childhood with an abusive father. And um, he came, he ran, away from, he ran away from the father. He somehow found his mother's address and his mother had left the father. He found his mother's address in a New York telephone book and took off, the mother was- I have to explain to this young group of people what a telephone book is. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We used to have those. Uh, they were big books. They had people's phone numbers in them. Yes. When you called them, the phone rang in their house. <laughs> <laughs> then a human answered it. <laughs> <laughs> he found the mother and he went, uh, he went to live with the mother who uh, was li living on welfare. And, and David, you know, basically somewhere between the age of nine and 12, ended up living on the, uh, li losing, leaving the mother, living on, living on the street. And... When, I, uh, when you hear about the life that David had, you can't imagine that he ever accomplished what he did. And I think Peter had a lot to do with it. I mean, David was, he would, he would live in dumpsters. This, he and his friend would live in dumpsters for weeks and weeks. He would go without food for so long. He would, um, and, and was in such bad physical shape, I can't believe that he was able to get anybody who would want to sleep with him. I mean, and, you know, he, he would say he would smoke a cigarette and blood would come out of his gums because his, he was in such bad shape. But Peter, you know, he met Peter, Peter recognized this, told him he was, that he should become a visual artist, and in fact, David did, although he's still doing all this stuff, and has, has said that every work that he did, everything that he did, he did for Peter. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And Peter yeah. had an awful childhood too. Um, uh, Peter didn't uh, know his father. Um, Peter had really an outstandingly awful mother. I mean, really outstanding. Um, but the, he never knew this father, although he, as a little boy, the mother sent him to live on his, I think his grandfather's farm um, in New Jersey. There were a lot of farms in New Jersey then. And that was okay but then the grandparents died. 
and he was sent to live with an uncle who had many children. And Peter used to tell me the story. The uncle, they were very mean to him, and every Sunday they would have ice cream for dessert, um, but not him. Wow. And the uncle would give the ice cream to all his children and not Peter. And then Peter told me, but one day my father came to visit me, and they didn't tell me. And I went home and I, the, there was a bag of candy on the kitchen table. And I said, what is this candy? They said, your father brought that for you. And I said, where is he? We told him to leave. And he said, I looked outside and I saw him running away. I said, Peter, that never happened. He said, yes, it happened. I said, it didn't happen. That's like a dream of a child, of a fatherless child. Mm. You know, that never happened. Um, and I also never knew anyone named Hujar. And he didn't either, so he kept like, we talked about his name a lot. He thought that might have been, you know, the, the uh, curse, you know, this name Hujar, which no one had. And then I was reading a book one day and I called him and I said, I found someone named Hujar. He said, who? I said, there was a famous Nazi general <laughs> <laughs> named Hujar. I said, he, I said, I don't think he was related to you. He was, was he Ukrainian? Was it his? It's a Polish name. I mean, at least this Nazi general was Polish. Right. You know, I don't want to really go everything by him, but um, I don't know. I mean, he grew up in an Irish neighborhood, the neighborhood that Peter, the, where Peter's mother lived, and then he went back to live with him. The, the mother re got married. I don't think the mother was married, married to Peter's father. I don't know. Um, and that father was an alcoholic, and he used to make, they used to sell beer, maybe they still do, in quart bottles. Um, it was much cheaper than to buy a small bottle of beer. And they used to make Peter take the bottles back when he was a young boy um, for the deposit that you got, the nickel deposit. And he was very mortified by this Peter. Mm. You know, Peter had like the instincts of like, you know, a French aristocrat, um, but which is very hard when you live the way Peter lived. You know, so he was like, um, and he left home when he was, uh, he left home when he was like 15 years old, Peter, mm -hmm. and he didn't drop out of school. I've never heard of anyone who left home as a teenager and kept going to high school. He kept going to school because he had one teacher that was encouraging to him and that really liked him, and she helped him get an apartment, which was on Bleecker Street, because every time we would pass it, he would say, that's where I lived when I was a teenager. And he would say, you know, I can't remember the amount of money, but it was something like, it was $25 a month, the apartment. I said, you should have kept it, Peter. This is like, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and this woman really encouraged Peter, and he stayed in school. He graduated from high school, which is, I mean, I was thrown out of high school, and I left home, and I did not keep going to high school, nor did I find a $40 or $25 a month apartment. <laughs> but, but you've said that Peter loved luxury. Oh, Peter loved the fancier the thing, the better. I, I, mean, I mean, this, of course, I share with Peter, but um, Peter... Um, w when he was sick, um, uh, if you think the healthcare system, you know, uh, was much better then in, the, in New York than it is now, but it was horrible. Um, and uh, Lynn Davis, who was a photographer and who was a good friend of Peter's, um, knew this uh, doctor, a very good doctor, very expensive doctor, and arranged for Peter to see him. And I took Peter to see him, and he told, you have to go in the hospital. Um, and uh, he, you have to go to Columbia Presbyterian, which then was just way uptown, like on 168th Street. And you have to, you know, you get a room. And so we took him up there, and we waited in the emergency room for, I'm not exaggerating, like six hours. Hmm. You know, and Peter was really sick. And there was so much violence in New York then that there were two emergency rooms, it turned out, A and B. A was a gunshot wound that you have, you're bleeding from your head. We were in the B, where you're just dying. You know, <laughs> but you're not, you don't have a bullet in you or a knife or an arrow in your head or, um, and so finally, I mean, he was so sick. I went to the front, to the desk and this intern came out and he said, you're Fran Leibowitz. I love your book, you're so funny. What are you doing, <laughs> what are you doing here? I said, well, my friend is very sick, we're trying to, he said, I'll take care of this. Uh, really, he said, there are no beds, there are no beds in the hospital. So he called the doctor. I said, look, do you know this doctor? Yes, yes, he's a very good doctor. Called him up. There was, and maybe still is, a, a part of that hospital called the Harkness Pavilion, which was a super fancy, luxurious wing of the hospital, um, where Sonny Von Bulow was living and lived there in a coma for 20 years. And he said, we're going to put him up there. He said, you know, I, could you sign this for me? And I said, you know, you shouldn't really run a hospital the way you run a restaurant. <laughs> You know, I mean, I like that in a restaurant, but in a hospital, really, you know, don't you think that's, oh, I don't know, wrong? <laughs> um, so he was in this room, this huge room in the Harkness Pavilion, where they had 
a cocktail pianist, a wine steward, where they bought tea every day. Uh, it's the happiest I ever saw Peter. <laughs> you know, and then, oh, but we went right from the doctor's office, so he didn't have any things, you know, his things with him. So he said, I need pajamas. I'd like some new pajamas. Can you get me some pajamas? So I said, sure. He said, I would like to have kind of pale lettuce green pajamas <laughs> um, with maybe a dark gray piping. I said, who would not? <laughs> he said, so can you get me this? So I thought, where am I gonna get these? So <clears throat> my, you know, my interest in and experience with men's pajamas, zero. Okay, <laughs> this was it. So I go to Brooks Brothers, which is 100 blocks downtown, and I'm having the guy show me, and I kept saying, no, those buttons are too big. He won't like those. You know, no, is the, you know, there's no piping around the buttonholes. Do you have one that's piping? And they said, you must, this guy must be really special. I said, you have no idea. <laughs> so, and also I bought him, I need slippers. So I bought him these really fancy leather slippers. And when I bought the stuff, he goes, not like these. I want the kind that have no backs. How am I going to get my... I said, Peter, I'm leaving them here. <laughs> like, you know, there's a limit. But he... The other thing, I think I told you this last night, um, in this room was um, a number of awful like prints like you would see in a hotel room or something. And there was one of, I don't know, a scene in a park or something. And David, every day, would draw something onto this picture. And he would say, uh, when do you think they're gonna notice this? I said, never. They're never gonna notice this. And it became very elaborate and very funny. And when Peter left, I wanted to take this, I really wanted to take this, and I thought, it was pretty big. I thought, you're gonna get caught. You're gonna get arrested for stealing a print from a hospital room. <laughs> you know, this is not gonna be good for you. So, um, and I left it there, and I'm sure that when they did notice it, they threw it away. So this is one of the regrets in my life, of, my, of the regrets in my life that are about not stealing things, this is number one. <laughs> but I'm sure, actually, I'm sure it's probably still there. You should go and check if the Harkness Pavilion still exists. And if it does, go to that room. You, you know, think, nobody ever looks at these things. You know, people. Well, uh, that's why he, and I kept saying no one's going to notice it, you know, and it became, it, they were fantastic, these drawings. Yeah, well, David loved to do, he also did drawings, and, and I can't figure out when he did these drawings. Peter lived on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 12th Street. And at the intersection, there's a number of photographs that Peter took of that intersection of chalk drawings or, or, spray paint, I don't know, that David did on that intersection at some point, maybe in the middle of the night. I mean, when else can you get on 2nd Avenue when there's not huge amounts of traffic going by? And he would do it so that Peter would look out the window and see that and it would entertain him. Yeah, I think they were chalk. I think they were chalk? I mean, the, the ones I remember were chalk, you know. Not that paint would last much longer there, but. Mm. But, um, so uh, David's feeling, which he expressed to people, was that his comfort was that he, even knowing that he, was, that he was going to die young, this was his feeling, was that Peter would outlive him and that he had this vision that after he was dead, he saw Peter in a room talking about David and what a wonderful person David was. Really? Yeah. <laughs> this I did not know. Yep. Um, when Peter died, Peter was 54. Um, it always says 53, and this is because when Peter turned 51, he decided he was 50. And we <laughs> argued about this. He said, I'm 50 now. I said, no, you're not, you're 51. He said, I'm 50. And like, he kept this up, so now it's actually like written places. You know, but Peter was actually 54. You know? um, and you know, I mean, I was uh, heartbroken when Peter died, but people kept saying, he's so young, and I thought, 54, that's not that young. Mm. Now, of course, I think a child. A child, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, David, um, when, you know, David went on to meet uh, and have a wonderful relationship with Tom Rothenbart, who he met while, while Peter was still alive. He was, uh, he was with Tom, yeah. And, He's um, still alive, right, Tom? Tom is still yeah, alive. Yeah. yeah, Tom is still alive. And um, at one point, Tom, Tom always felt that David really never told him he loved him enough. Tom was always telling David he loved him and David didn't tell Peter, or didn't, uh, uh, David didn't tell Tom that he loved him. And so he, he asked him, what, do you love me? And, and, and David said, in, in this order, my art, Peter, and then you. 
do you love me is a question you should not ask. <laughs> if that question comes to your mind, the answer is no. <laughs> if you have to ask. Yeah, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, but Peter, but we were talking before about the gravestone that David made for Peter. Peter for, loved this dur, this etching of a dur wing. And that's what, it comes up in, in um, uh, David did a big painting, four elements paintings, and one of them was called Wind for Peter Hoosier. And that had that wing on there. And then later for the um, gravestone, it was that dur wing that he put on the gravestone. Did Peter ask for that or David just? I don't know. I know that when the gravestone finally was finished, we went up there. Um, I think Nan Golden, um, David, uh, maybe Ethel, John, John Erdman, John Erdman, in my car, in my fantastic car, which I still have. Um, and Nan took a photograph of me there uh, at, at the grave. Them, mm. And then gave it to me, which of course is not the sort of thing that you like hang in your house, you know. Um, the only time I, I mean I still own it. I mean is it, it's a fantastic Nan Golden photograph, um, but it's not exactly cheerful. Right. But the only time I really saw it hanging for any length of time, it was in a show that Nan had, I think, at the Guggenheim. Um, and uh, Nan was the only other like younger artist that I ever heard Peter say he liked. You know, not as much as he liked David, but, um, you know, uh, he really liked her work. She's a fantastic artist. Yeah, she is, but I mean... I never saw her do a... I, did she ever photograph Peter? I never saw a Peter. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not, you know, 100% familiar with everything she photographed, but um, I never heard him say he, he... He hated most photographers. You know, I mean, he hated their work. How about Robert Mapplethorpe? Robert... <laughs> Peter and I shared a distaste for Robert. Um, it wasn't just, uh, but the, one of the reasons that Peter thought Robert was um, silly, you know, um, which he was, um, and he thought, you know, that, and he thought that Robert copied him in certain ways, which of course he did. Mm. Um, and also, you know, I mean, Sam Wagstaff, who was, you know, the patron of Robert, um, tried to be the patron of Peter, you know, when they were younger. And Sam Wagstaff was also a dazzlingly handsome, you know, I mean, really handsome when he was young. Even when he was older, Sam was very handsome. Um, but, you know, Peter was not having that, you know, he was not going to be a rich man's toy, which Robert was dying to be a rich man's toy. Um, and so Robert, um, in an effort I always believed to get me to tell Peter yeah, because he really sought Peter's approval, you know, and so um, he was always giving me photographs. I mean, Robert was. Um, he would just show up in my apartment, buzz a buzzer, and say, oh, it's Robert giving me more of this stuff. And he would, like, bring it up, and he would, then he would ask me, you know, did you show it to Peter? Did Peter like this? And, and so when I moved from this apartment, um, which was, you know, the size of this table, but not as nice or clean, um, when I moved from that apartment, I thought, this is the perfect time to get rid of this Maplethorpe junk. Um, and there were so many of these Maplethorpes. In those days, the trash cans in New York were metal, and they were in the street, and you had to bring your, this was in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to bring your uh, uh, trash down to the street and put in these metal cans. There were so many of these Maplethorpe photographs that I couldn't get them into the can. Oh my God. So I have this vision of myself every time I see his auction prices. Uh, <laughs> I have a vision of myself jumping on them so they would break so I could get them into the can. And when I, <clears throat> when I told this story once to Matthew Marks many years ago, and he said, I don't understand, friend. I can understand you didn't like the work or that you didn't like Robert, but how could you not know that someone that driven would be famous? I said, he was already famous, a little bit, in 1979. Sure. I said, it just never occurred to anyone that photographs would be so uh, expensive. They would have so much monetary value. It never came into anyone's mind. You know, it's, it, obviously, if I had known that, I wouldn't have thrown them away, you know? <laughs> uh, I also wouldn't be here. I'd be in my villa in Tuscany, <laughs> you know? I mean, so I, I would say I had at least, at least a dozen. I know that when I did, um, the year before Peter died, I did a wonderful, um, you came to that show, a wonderful sh show for Peter. And it, um, 
it he was threatened to break a bar stool over your head. No, no, and he didn't. I mean, all of these, you know, these stories, I happened to the first artist of this, there was the triumvirate of Paul Tech, Peter Hujar, and David Von Rovich, who were, you know, difficult, the three most difficult artists, you know, alive. And I met Paul Tech before I met either of them out in Oakleyville, and, and Paul just, you know, went on and on and on about Every single, every single, you know, person. This curator, she's a woman. She really went to sleep with me. It was really horrible. This uh, Barbara Gladstone, you know, she's she's terrible. Come and visit me in the studio. She's given me for free to work in <laughs> while I pr produce this show. And then, uh, and then it turns out he does this wonderful show with these little mice. The what, mice. He never. He refuses to go to the gallery because he's so angry by the time the show happens. I mean, he. This is like sort of a phenomena that uh, you know this is a particular attitude of these guys that's what they shared I mean there's a, a, a friend of mine named Vince Oletti. he's a photographer critic mm -hmm. and he's a writer and he was a he lived across the street from Peter and they was very he was very close with Peter and he uh, here was Peter's complaint about Vince oh, Vince he's always trying to improve my life I said <laughs> he is an awful man <laughs> you know I mean Vince gave me some pottery and Peter came to my house and he saw it and he goes he gave me one of those too he is always <laughs> trying to give me these nice things. I said, he's horrible. How can you bear him? <laughs> yes, how, can, how can you be around him? <laughs> so then at, at some point, Paul Tech want, you know, uh, wants, to do, wants me to do a show for him. So, of course, I, I mean, I, I guess I have the same disease because I'm like, oh, no, this really faint. No, I'm not going to do the show with him because I think he's going to hate me if I do the show. So I would rather, like, not show Paul Tech and, you know, not have a gallery now, then be destitute. Well, I'm not destitute, but anyway. Um, but Peter, then, you know, I met Peter, and I put Peter in, in a number of shows, but I would never, ever think of asking Peter to do a show because he had this reputation of being brutal with every dealer and being horrible to deal with. I mean, in the group shows I put him in, he was perfectly fine, but I would never have thought to give him a show. But it was David who came to me and I guess once Peter was uh, di diagnosed, and um, asked me to do this show for Peter, which, you know, I was in heaven, of course. And Peter was wonderful to work with, totally wonderful. A unique story. <laughs> or as people now say, very unique is like. <laughs> and and we um, after uh, after his opening, we had a. Uh, a big party. Back in those days, when you, you know, you had a gallery and you had an opening, the clubs would call you up and say, please do your after opening party with us. Open bar, you don't have to pay for a thing. Those were the great days. So we, um, this was at the Palladium, which was the biggest club at the time. They wanted to do Peter's after opening party. And um, in the Michael Todd room, which was like a great place, this, I remember, you don't remember this. I remember this. I talked to Sir. He doesn't remember this either. So maybe I dreamed this up. But there was, not only was it in the Michael Todd room, which was beautiful, it was the whole ceiling was filled with, and I've always wanted to duplicate this, but I've never had an apartment big enough. But this room, I, I love, I would live in this room forever. The whole ceiling was crystal chandeliers, and then there was a wall that was all gilded mirrors. So beautiful. So a good um, place for Jute to live, don't you think? It's a good, <laughs> it sounds like a porn set. I remember that. Jute room. Harper. Steve Rubell owned that place. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Um, so at some point, and not only is it like hot and cold, running free drinks and uh, food, maybe probably not. No food. Lots of drinks. No, we never ate. It's amazing we're alive. No. Yeah. Never ate. Okay. Um, and there was like a famous. Uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there was a performance, a performance by a famous black female singing group that I can't remember who it was. I'm thinking like the Shirelles, somebody that was like from back from the 70s or something, and there they were. Shirelles were from the 60s. Okay, so 60s. I, don't, I don't remember who this was. I, I said to you, well, maybe it was the Pointer Sisters. You know, Point, it could have been the Pointer Sisters. But I, I don't remember who I don't was. know. Anyway, anyway it, was, it was elaborate and, and wonderful. And Peter was a joy to work with. The only downside of this is that very, f very few pieces sold from that exhibition, which was disappointing to, very disappointing to Peter. Um, and 
one very disappointing thing is that the critic at the time for the Village Voice was Gary Indiana. Gary, who should have written a glowing review for Peter, instead wrote something horrible. Horrible, because he was in love with David Von Rovich and he wanted to get back at Peter because David wouldn't have an, a <coughs> have an affair with him. <coughs> this is the entire history of art, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is not just these guys at this moment. This is, you always have to remember this, you know, when you read things of the 19th century, the 18th century, you know, if you like get to find out the personal point, that's the reason. Yeah, well that, well, that was it for, for Peter, that was it. Um, but in this, in this show, which, which it was, in, in a way, the show that's now up at Loewe, that was the hanging of Peter's work, uh, Maria did, which was a fantastic show. I hope you all go and see this Peter and David show. I mean, for one reason, the selection is incredible. I mean, it's really it's, very it's touching. It's a very incredible distillation of a sensibility. I think it's, it's a great show. You have to see it. Yeah. It's right near here somewhere. And it's <laughs> un unbelievably... It's in the same town. It's in this town. <laughs> It's the first time that Peter and David have been shown together, so it's a pretty uh, um, emotional uh, show for me to see, for us to see. I think to see the two of them in, in, in one room, and both, you know, unfortunately no longer, no longer with us. But Gary and Diana is alive. Yeah, this is, this is how, how life works out. <laughs> we, still have, we still have Gary to deal with. Yeah. Um, but, but David, when... Um, you were talking about, you know, one of the most famous pieces is um, Candy Darling in her deathbed. And that was, um, that piece was, was in my exhibition. And Peter was in the front, and in the back part was Al Hansen. And Al Hansen's show did really well, like everything sold. And so Al said that he, you know, he wanted to buy a piece of Peter's. And so he bought that, that piece of Peter's, which was, wonderful, and Al was somebody who like lived with two shopping bags, you know, basically. He, he didn't care where he lived, he didn't care about money, so he took this piece, he left, he died a number of years later, and I said to the family, look for that Peter Hujar piece, because that's an incredible piece. They couldn't find it anywhere, it was nowhere to be found, and it turned out that after he left New York, he was living in Cologne, he went and stayed in Holland for a while, and he stayed with an artist, and he said, here, let me give you this as a gift. Because he didn't like to have possessions. But you were saying that Peter, um, were, you there, were you there when he took, you were there when he took yes, the photos? Yes, I went to the hospital with him. To, Candy asked him to do that, you know, to take that photograph. And he told me, you want to come? I said, Peter, I don't think you should do that. I mean, Candy is dying. That's horrible. Candy was young. Candy was 27 when she died, you know. Um, even I thought that was young, even though I was like 23, you know. Um, he said, no, no, she wants me to do it, and she did. So we went to the hospital. She, someone did her makeup, her hair, you know. Um, she posed for those photographs. I thought it was horrible. Not the photographs, fantastic. Mm. But I thought, I can't imagine. This is what you care about when you're dying, you know, but this is what she cared about. Um, and then when Candy died, um, Peter and I went to the funeral together. Uh, which was at Frankie Campbell's, which is the fanciest funeral home in New York, still is, um, and uh, this guy named Sam Green paid the f for the funeral. It was winter, and when we got to the funeral home, the, we went into the, I don't know what you call it, the room where the body was, which is the first time I ever saw an open casket. And the casket was open, and on the back of it, it was a very elaborate casket, quilted, silk, and, um, there were these, um, I think they're called mass cards. There's some sort of thing from the Catholic Church. They were there with rosary beads. And then also these photographs of Candy, like these publicity shots. And Candy was in the coffin, um, in full drag, in full makeup. Right. And I was shocked by this. And Peter was wearing a, his big coat, and he was right behind me, and all of a sudden, he takes his camera out, and he takes a picture of, of the thing. And I was so angry at him for doing this. I said, this is awful. He goes, she would have wanted me to do this. I said, how do you know? And I think he, she probably would have, you know. Mm. Um, I think I thought about that with Peter for like two days, and I've never seen that photograph of Candy dead. 
Mm. Have you ever seen that? I haven't seen it, no. You know, I mean, I'm, the Morgan must have it now in one of those contact sheets, but I, I mean, he might have printed it, but he wouldn't have shown it to me because I never wasn't angry about that. Well, when, you know, David was with Peter when Peter died, and um, when Peter died, he shut the door, and he had somebody wait outside saying, don't let anybody into the room, and he uh, filmed Peter, and then he took 23 photographs of Peter, dead. And um, it's interesting because 23 was something that was a recurring theme for David. He did, uh, early on, he did these plaster heads and he did 23 of them because there were the 23 chromosomes. And then he, he I think something he wrote was self-portrait in 23 parts. And it was interesting. He did 23 photos of David and then made it into like a really beautiful. You mean a Peter? A Peter. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, a, a, a beautiful compilation photograph of Peter with text over Peter top. Peter died on Thanksgiving Day. And um, David was there and Lynn Davis and Rudy Willis, her, her husband, were there. Uh, and they called me, I was at my aunt's in Poughkeepsie. And so I left, you know, but Poughkeepsie's not around the corner. By the time I got there, it was like probably two and a half, three hours later. P they still, but the, Dave didn't have to worry because at the Mother Cabrini Hospital, which no longer exists, no one had bothered to come in to take Peter away. Peter was still oh my God. in the bed with his eyes open. You know, I mean, that's the thing that shocked me. And I said, why is he still here? No, we, you know, do they not know he died? You know, yes, but they haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, so when I went in, Rudy was in the room with him. Um, Rudy is a Buddhist, or at least was a Buddhist, and was saying some Buddhist something. Um, and I was flabbergasted. I said, David was still there. I mean, I think David might have been there all night. You know, for, I mean, the night before. Right. I hope that cheered you up. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Ah. There. It's okay. me again. Yeah, I would like to ask you uh, because Peter Huhar also took photos of you sometimes. I'm sorry. Uh, Peter Huhar yes. he took photos of you yes. sometimes. I guess more than more than once. Uh, how was the experience of being photographed by him? I mean, how did, did you did he direct you? I mean, how was that? Um, uh, in case you didn't hear me say that Peter uh, took many pictures of me, and what was the experience like? Of Peter taking my picture. First of all, I have to preface it by saying that I have always hated having my photograph taken. Hey guys, I realize I am now the only person in the world that is true of. Um, and so I didn't, you know, I mean, I, I hated, you know, it less with Peter, you know, but I really did not like the experience. I don't like the experience of having my photograph taken. Um, but with Peter, you know, he, yes, he d would direct you, you know, in the sense of like, you know, but Peter's, as far as, my experience with Peter, not just as a photographer, but even just walking in the street with him, he was centrally preoccupied with light. You know, Peter taught me many things, and one of the things he taught me was to think about light all the time, which I have ever since. Peter always would, you know, no matter what, where you were, no matter what his mood, um, he would tell you, look at that light. You know, he was incredibly uh, sensitive to this. Uh, and so that, the thing I most remember about having my picture taken by Peter is about the light. You know, Peter would never say like, you know, put your hand here, or, or not with me or anything. Do, he, but he would say, move this way because the light is, you know, um, that, that's my main, you know, uh, memory of being directed by Peter. This may not have always been the case, you know, in, in, in his other photographs, but that is, was the case with me. I love that photograph of you in your bedroom in Morristown. Oh, your sister, your sister's yes, bedroom. Yes, that photograph, I don't know if you've seen this photograph, but that photograph I didn't even know existed until a couple years ago. Um, someone, people, I do not have uh, these modern devices that you all have. I do not have a cell phone, I do not have a computer, I do not have a microwave oven, I have none of these things. And yet, I'm alive. Um, so, I didn't know, and so people started calling me on the phone I have in my apartment that I answer. Um, and people started calling me and say, Lena Dunham tweeted a photograph of you um, in bed. Uh, and, is, and I said, what photograph? So someone showed it to me on their phone. 
And it said under the photograph, uh, Fran Leibowitz's apartment, 1974. This was not my apartment in 1974. This was my sister's bedroom at my parents' house. Um, and this photograph was at that time in a show at Leslie Lohman, which is a small gallery in uh, Soho. So I went to see the show, which is the first time I saw this photograph. And the uh, guy at the gallery said, you know, uh, do you have this photograph? I said, I, I didn't even know it existed. I mean, when I saw the photograph, Peter came several times with me to my parents' house. There was nothing more exotic to Peter Hujar than middle-class suburban life. You know, this was to him an impenetrable, wondrous thing. You know, um, and he really liked going to my parents' house, um, who were, you know, neither impenetrable nor wondrous, but middle class and suburban. Uh, and so Peter stayed overnight, he, you know, a couple times there. So he must have come in to, that room was my bedroom when I was living with my parents. And the second I moved out, I wasn't even out the door. My sister moved into that room uh, because it was bigger. That wallpaper was my sister's choice, not mine. I feel it's imperative that I tell you this. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, when I saw the photograph, I thought, well, Peter must have come into the bedroom and just, and Peter had that camera all the time. So he must have, like, knocked on the door, come in, and say, can I take your picture? And, you know, I said yes, but I never saw it printed, you know? Mm -hmm. And then someone said, that's impossible. No one looks like that when they just get up. I said, you do if you're 24, <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's that photograph, which I did not even know existed. Peter seems so cosmopolitan to me. It's amazing to think that he would go stay overnight in Morristown at your, at your parents' house. Yeah, my parents really liked him. It's my impression that they did not know he was gay. Um, it's my impression that they were not sure about me. Uh, and, you know, my mother, of course, you know, she loved Peter. He was very handsome, mm -hmm. you know. Um, my father liked Peter because Peter was butch. Peter, my father never would have. Th that is not at all the kind of man my father would have thought was gay. They loved Peter on their coffee table, where Peter's um, you know, books signed to them. Um, when my father died, I took that book, and it was you know, for Ruth and Harold, and it was, I have a photograph of Peter at my parents at a, at a Seder wearing a yarmulke. Um, not his best look, not anyone's best look. Let's, uh, um, uh, but he was really, yes, he was very interested. In, you know, let's go into the town. You know, where did you go to high school? He took pictures, you know, because it was like a, a, a fairy tale to him that people lived like that, you know. He had zero experience of that. I lived in Morristown for a few minutes. And the one thing I remember about Morristown is there was some big hullabaloo about a homeless person that was like going into the library every day. That was much later. That was probably like in the 90s or yeah. the 80s. Yeah. That homeless person in the library um, was the son of someone my mother knew. Uh, yeah. So uh, they didn't want him in the library because um, apparently he was not that clean. Um, there was something, this guy was crazy. Um, the, um, the Jews of Marstown um, like got together and got him an apartment because they were so mortified <laughs> that this homeless person was Jewish. Um, and, uh, but he refused to stay in the apartment because homelessness was his like, profession. It was, it was not even a necessity. Yes, but it, there were no homeless people in Morristown when I lived there. There were no homeless people in the country. There was no such thing as homeless people until Ronald Reagan was the president. And that's the truth. Like, if you remember, there were people in the street in New York, what, di what did you call them? Bums. Right. They, were, they were street, you know, and there weren't a million of them. You know, there just weren't a million of them like there are now, a zillion of them, you know, and that is because, um, Mostly the people like in the street were like, uh, you know, uh, alcoholics, you know, or um, people didn't really feel sorry for them, not particularly sorry for them. Um, there was also something called, oh, I don't know, public housing, you know, I mean, so, uh, yeah, that was something Marstown became famous for, for. but Peter missed that era. Hmm. Any, any, any more questions, más preguntas por parte del público? Yes. Yes. Hi. This is not a question about Peter or David. It's more about your book, Gracie. I've read somewhere that your first gallery was in the bathroom of your apartment in New York. Is that true? And how was it? Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. The, I lived, uh, because I came in the 80s and I didn't, was not given 
a loft when I came through the Holland Tunnel. I, uh, I lived in a fifth floor walk up uh, tenement apartment, which was $75 a, a month. And it was, which was very common at that time, there was a bathtub in the kitchen and then there was a room with a toilet. So it was very small. And I had photographs of my friend Timothy Greathouse up on the wall. So one day I said to Timothy, oh, I'm gonna give you a show in my bathroom. Great, he said. So I designed stationery and it was, it was kind of like a performance. I designed the stationery, I did a press release, um, and it was, it was um, you know, kind of on the theory of less is more, uh, uh, intimate, uh, one at a time viewing in an intimate setting, um, the artwork that will fit in an East Village apartment, uh, you know, all, all of these things. And it, was, it looked like a regular press release, and I uh, sent it out. At that time, we all did everything together. And this was not an extraordinary thing. There were many people doing crazy shows everywhere. This just happened to be a show that um, we did this mailing and somebody from the Village Voice showed up and uh, it was the one person, it was, it was an absolute mob scene and it was one person that I didn't know and I went up to him and said, who are you? And he said, oh, I write for the Village Voice. So then they proceeded to write a huge long article, which Frank can tell you, which was an amazing thing at that time. It was the like- The Village Voice was like very important. I mean, the ev most everything, important. yes, the most important. Everything I got in my life, I got from the Village Voice. My apartment, my jobs, you know. <laughs> the, the Village Voice came out on Wednesdays, you know, when I was a kid and I worked these horrible jobs. Um, I worked six days a week, but not Wednesday, because Wednesday the Village Voice came out where I was gonna get a better horrible job. Um, every single thing was in Village Voice. And, and in the course of writing this article, they said, who's your next show? Well, I, there was no intention of there ever being a next show. It had, because I wanted it to look like it was a gallery, I had the, the date from like the first to the 30th, 30 days, and then it was the opening date, and then the rest of the month by appointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and we, I, we served, uh, I think I got a $250 uh, tax refund, which is how I threw this party. And we served cigarettes. You would like that, right? Well, um, very nutritious. <laughs> very nutritious. Cigarettes. Gluten free. Cigarettes and something called turtles, which was from my Pittsburgh background. Turtles were. Uh, candy. They right? were candy. They were like walnuts. Caramel, walnuts, chocolate. Yeah, totally, totally delicious. And by. The, so I did a second show because they said, who's the next show? So I like, la, 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 let me come up with a name. I did. And then the third show was, um, because then it's like, you know, why not continue? So the third show I did was for Stephen Lack, who was the star in Scanners. So that, um, and which was kind of a cult film. So that, uh, that announcement for that opening made page six of the post, which was another, you know, what everybody read about what celebrities were doing. And there was such a mob scene on this little street in the East Village that they redirected the bus traffic and a super shows up. Well, I didn't even, you know, I didn't even know I had a super. I'm like, this guy oh. said, I'm your super. I'm like, I've never seen you before yeah, in my you, life. Could you come in and fix the leak? <laughs> right. <laughs> and they said, this is it. No more shows. So... Ended after he must have been the super for the entire city, because he no was, one ever saw their super. Yeah, no, he was not. They're mythical I mean, figures. I mean, this was, I had, you know, it was one of these landladies, of course, $75 a month, they never did anything in this building. And I, I keep saying, I, why did I ever give up that apartment? You know, if I, if I had that apartment now, 75, but at some point, I did move out, and the back wall of the building fell off. But people refuse, this is like so New York, they refuse to move. They, like, they put like plywood up in the back and, and half of the apartments, because these toilets were on one side, they were here and on the other side, they were there. So on one side of the apartment, they had to give up their toilets. They bought chemical toilets so they could stay in this building until they put the back of it back because on again. one wall is better than none, <laughs> right? right? No one's giving up an apartment, no one's moving. No one. Um, Hence homelessness. <laughs> yes. Now that you mentioned the cigarettes, I got a question for you, Frank. Okay. Uh, do you still smoke? Do I still smoke? Yes, yes. of course. Okay. 
Why do you think I'm in such vibrant condition? What I'm going to ask you that question. Because in New York, you have to smoke outside yeah, here too, but I a little less. I, I used to live in New York. I ask you that question because you brought up a very funny piece <laughs> in defense of the smoker. I'm sorry. I you brought a very funny piece oh, about smoking. defending the smoking about smoking. It didn't yeah. work. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. People go like, you know, I saw you on Bill Maher. It's great what you said about Trump. It's great. Keep doing it. I go, why? It doesn't work. You know, I mean, I tell people what to do, no one ever does it. So people, sometimes people have yelled at me and said, you're a bad role model for kids. I said, I'm not a role model, no one does what I say. That's the opposite of a role model. So yes, I did write that piece about smoking and I still smoke and um, you have to smoke outside in New York all the time and so um, I always say no one gets more fresh air than New York smokers. You know, we're like Olympic skiers. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, you just spoke. You spoke recently about how um, back in the 70s you would never expect uh, photography to re uh, photographs to reach that amount of money and value. Uh, now, in our days, more and more people are taking pictures, and with technology, they think it's okay and worth showing to 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 the rest of the world more and more. So, my question to both of you is: How do you see? How do you think the technology is affecting the art of photography? Is something good coming out of? the fact that more and more people are taking photographs from their own cell phones sometimes. And thank you for coming, for making this, everything, for making this possible also. And you're welcome. Um, <laughs> he said, how do I think the fact that everyone takes photographs now affects photography? Um, well, everyone can take photographs, you know, but it doesn't make you a photographer. I mean, it makes you a photographer in, this, you know, in the strictest sense of the word. It just doesn't make you talented. You know, here's the thing that has disappeared from the you know, minds of humanity. You know, talent. I know, a horrible word because it's so elitist. Um, but yes, anyone can take a photograph. Anyone can write. You know, anyone can design something. You know, anyone can do any of these things. It's not whether you do them, it's how you, well you do them. This is a very unpopular thing to say. I'm aware of that, but I'm not running for anything. Um, but, but also, I, you know, people are always, people take photographs all the time. I noticed a fantastic thing at the Prado yesterday. I mean, I don't mean just the fantastic work at the Prado. There were no selfie sticks. I hope that's a rule there, and I hope it catches on. You know, because I always think like, really? You came here and your entire interest in Goya is how you look standing next to it? Here's how you look standing next to it, like an idiot. Okay, especially compared to Koya. You know, if you want to look good, don't stand next to a genius. <laughs> I have to say, I have a, a list of like gripes that gets like longer and longer and longer. And selfies is like right at the top along with service dogs. Service dogs. Well, service dogs that are really service dogs, you mean like blind people are allowed to have dogs. Right. Okay, what I object to is I don't know if you have this here, it's called emotional support animals. And they, by law, are supposed to wear like a little vest, which first of all, animals, they're already dressed when you get them, believe me. Um, <laughs> there's, and it says on it in letters, E-S-A, emotional support animal. And you are allowed to bring these anywhere, including into the first class cabin of airplanes, where <laughs> other people, such as Fran, are sitting and not <laughs> expecting to see an animal. Um, <laughs> And what, thing, what has disappeared completely in the United States is embarrassment, okay? <laughs> no one is embarrassed. Like, grown men are not embarrassed to say, this is my emotional support dog. <laughs> Which is, in fact, what is that? It's a teddy bear. You know, I can't get on a plane without him. You know, I'm too scared. So I think, you know, I would rather sit next to someone who had a gun Okay, then had a little dog with a little vest on that said ESA on it. It's like not bad. You used to like get on a plane and think that the pe person with the baby was sitting far away from you. You know, now you hope that the person with the dog is sitting far away from you and next to the baby. <laughs> but, but I will address what you were saying about photography. I'll get back to that. I mean, one, uh, an amazing thing that's happened is that you, uh, they no longer make uh, like four by five transparencies. It used to be everybody, you know, you would have to have a four by five transparency of everything that you wanted to sell. 
you can't get four by five, that kind of negative or whatever doesn't exist. I, I don't even know if slide I I exists. You can't get uh, Peter printed on Portriga rapid paper. You can't get, they, they don't make photo paper anymore. No, I mean, it's, it's, you know, this has become, um, everything is, is digital. Everything gets printed digitally. And um, even when you go to see the show, you'll see that some of the photographs that are in the show now were digitally printed by Gary Schneider for Peter Hujar. And Gary was the master printer. Gary and, and John, their collection of prints, because when they did prints, they took prints from the artists in exchange for, for doing them. And their collection is at Harvard right now, a big show of, of all their collection. Gary is a master, and he says that he can get a better print digitally now than he could uh, making a negative and, and, and printing it the way Peter did. And Peter, well, Peter was a total master printer. I mean, Peter, you know, everything was, but uh, not dotted, I forget what they call it, you know. He, he would print and print until he got the best possible. He had a dart room in his loft. Yeah. You know, yeah, and he would say, come in, I'll show you how to do it. I said, it smells awful in there. <laughs> it was some kind of horrible chemical. It's a, um, but there are a lot of people, I mean, Scorsese um, always says, you know, uh, he has a screening room, a uh, really good screening room, um, and he always shows you on film in his screening room, and he always says, can't you see that this is better, and I can't. You know, I actually, I'm sorry, I, I believe Marty. If Marty says that, I believe him. But I can't see, it's like when they renovated Carnegie Hall for the first time, and every, you know, all my friends who are like, have perfect ears would say, oh, it's not as good, can't you hear that? No. <laughs> I, I wish I could, but I can't. You know, but I take your word for it. You know, I take Marty's word for it. If he says, this is better, it's better. You know, but I really can't tell the difference. Hmm. You know, but Peter was very meticulous about printing. I mean, he was, you know, I, what if Peter was alive now, you know, I bet you he would insist to still print it. And he would like, you know, have stocked up on printing paper, whatever you call that stuff. Right. And, um, but I was right that, that whatever that stuff is smelled awful. Yes, you know, it did. Peter made me, I um, have only half a brain. Um, and the half that I don't have um, encompasses everything other than what you know I do have. Um, and that is science, math, you know. And so one of the things I could never, when, for instance, when they first started being, you know, they sent men to the moon, people said, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that unbelievable? Someone thought of that. And truthfully to me, it was no more unbelievable than a light bulb. That seems just as unbelievable to me. Um, I would never have thought of a light bulb. I would never have thought of a rocket ship. And I would never have thought of a camera, which really seems, in a way, the most amazing invention to me. So I told this to Peter once. He tried to explain to me. So I explained, you can make, uh, take a photograph with a shoebox. And so Peter made me this thing, it's called a pinhole camera. Mm -hmm. And it's really a shoebox that has, as far as I can tell, just a hole in it that he made and then d took a picture with it once and then gave me the, and I still, I have moved that shoebox from apartment to apartment. Uh. And sometimes people say, this whole shoebox, what is this for? There's no shoes, on oh, don't touch that. I'll take <laughs> that with me. Um, so I still have the shoebox, but I still don't understand it. And, and, and David never did, I mean, David, did take photographs when he was much younger. In fact, one of his tricks bought him a camera, and he used to take photographs incessantly and put them in the uh, the, the bus terminal. Had used to have lockers at that time, and David would put all of his uh, negatives, all of the print things, in those lockers, and then never pick, and then forget to pick them up. They were only good for you would have to go every 24 hours and put money back in, and a he quarter. wouldn't do it. Hmm? A quarter. Yes. You put a quarter in. Could be put a quarter. Um, but when Peter died, and Frank can tell you, David got Peter's apartment. He was able to move into Peter's apartment and get, along with that, a dark room. And then he really, that the photographs that you see um, in the exhibition were all printed in Peter's dark room. I mean, David really incorporated photography into his work starting then. Yeah. You mean starting after Peter died? After Peter died. Really, I didn't realize that. I, I, did, I thought he, was, he took pictures before that. He, he took pictures, but he didn't, I mean, he had no dark room. he didn't. And I think he was in, in, embarrassed maybe to, you know, Peter was perfect about printing. I think David would never, or anybody would never say, oh, can I use your dark room? Never. No, you know, no one no. said it, and he would have said no. Right. If he would have answered. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions?
Yes. 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 I'm oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Fran Hi. and Gracie. Thank you for your talk. Just wanted to ask you, what's your favorite work of Peter? Your favorite picture? The picture you like most? You know, I'm not like a big favorite person. Like, I mean, there's so few things I like that the things that I like, I like them, I wouldn't say all equally, but I don't have like one favorite. I mean, um, I mean, uh, the, in this show here, um, there is a, a, the self-portrait of Peter uh, lying down. I have that That's photograph, simple. it's in my apartment. Um, and you know, you see it as soon as you come into my living room. Um, and so I have an, an emotional response to that. When I saw that, I thought, every time I see it, you know, even when I, every time I walk into my own apartment, I think, Pete, there's Pete. You know, okay. it's like, uh, I always respond to that photograph, but that doesn't mean I think it's his best photograph or, you know, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't even know what his best photograph was. I have two favorite photographs of, of Peter, and oddly they were both from the, he was hired by Diane B to do a photo shoot. And one of them is um, David Von Rovich under a uh, blanket. And, uh, and I love that photograph. It's so sweet of David. And I have lucky enough to live with that. But my other favorite one is Greer Langton's legs. It's not in, not in this exhibition, but I love that photo. It wasn't at the Morgan either, was it? It wasn't at the Morgan either. No. No. Oh, but what's here is, I say Butch and Billy, but it wasn't Butch and Billy, but the two, uh, the two oh, cows. The cows. That's two, a fantastic one. Yes. I bought, I bought one photograph from Peter, um, and it was a cow. Not those two cows, or it might have been one of those cows. I'm not an expert mm. on discerning either. If I can't tell the difference between the acoustics of Carnegie Hall, my ability to distinguish between cows, zero. Um, but I bought that photograph from Peter for a girl, um, and... Peter, I said, how much is it photograph? He said, $50. Do you think that's wow. too much? I said, well, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and I, uh, that's the only time I ever bought a photograph from him. Yeah. Last, last question. Yes. Hi, uh, you've been talking about New York in that period of time and I've read once that you used to defend New York from the haters of New York, and now you defend New York uh, from the people that love New York. This is what, this is a perfect description of life. <laughs> yes, no, he, I, said, he said, you used to defend New York from the people who hated New York, and now you have to defend it from the people who love yeah, New York. Yeah, I would like to explain that a little bit more. <laughs> um, well, you know, when I first moved to New York, the entire country hated New York. You know, being hated by every other part of the United States is always a good sign, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, especially now, now it's really a good sign. Um, it's like when the, these Trump supporters say, New Yorkers, they live in a bubble. I think, New York is not a bubble. New York is New York. You live in a bubble. Um, so, but now that New York is so popular, you know, and last year, and this was announced proudly by the mayor's office, Last year in New York City were 58 million tourists. 58 million tourists. There are only eight million residents. You know, um, a tiny number relative to that. And so, you know, this, uh, and of course, tourists ruin everything. It doesn't matter where they go. It, it, you know, it's not that they just ruin Venice, you know, or they just ruin, they ruin every place. Because, you know, in our current uh, situation, um, I, I've said this for a long time, you know, immigrants make the culture, tourists destroy it. You know, so, <clears throat> if I was in charge, which I've wanted to be forever, I would stand at the borders of New York and I would think, okay, we can take 58 million people. Clearly, we had them here last year. So, <clears throat> Every place there's a hotel in New York, by the way, there's not an apartment building, okay? Hence, homelessness. So, <clears throat> I, I would stand at the border, and as people had to come in through one entrance where I was in charge, I would say, how long are you staying? And if they said three weeks, I would say, no. <laughs> no, you either come to live here, or you can't come in. <laughs> you know, so it's as simple as that. So, tourists, you know, the, the American tourists who come to New York, um, which th they always seem to think, you know, you know what's a good time to go to New York? How about August? <laughs> when, when the homeless people leave New York because it's too horrible. Um, 
I always think like, but they don't really like New York. So, be, but they come to New York, and the people in charge of New York, by which I mean the people who own everything, they want them to come to New York because they spend their money there. Um, and so, but they don't like New York. So they've had to make New York something that these people like. You know, so, you know, that's what Times Square is like now. That is what, you know, that's what all these places, you know, um, I always say to people, I hate the theater, I never go. And someone said to me, you know, friend, in the 1920s, you would have written for the theater. It's what you hate what it is now, you know, and it's what it is now is what these people like, you know, and my feeling is, you know, don't, you know, you see them in Times Square and I think, don't you have a McDonald's where you live? <laughs> Or they stand there with their jaw open looking up and I think, are there that many parts of the country that have no electricity? <laughs> I mean, because I, I live in Chelsea and I'm telling you, if you walk up 7th Avenue starting at 14th Street, you can see the light from Times Square. Okay, that's too bright, right? It's, it's yeah. too much light. Um, it's not that Times Square was ever, you know, some beautiful seaside town, you know, but no one ever thinks what happened to the, you know, uh, indigenous people of Times Square. Like, no one ever says, what happened to our three-card Monte dealers? Where are our hookers? Where, what happened to them when, they, when Disney came in? I mean, yeah. David Von Arovich, where are the David Von Aroviches of today? That's right, I mean, you know. Not turning tricks on Times Square anymore. That's right, and then I mean, there used to be, I mean, of course the internet ended the street hooker business, you know what I mean, you know. Um, but, you know, it was at least native to the area. I don't so know what you, you asked, you but that's your me, answer. Are you telling me that poor, uh, poor uh, men, boys, girls, that they have, uh, that they're advertising on the internet even though they can't afford like a hotel room or a... Um, you mean hookers? I, uh, yeah. Why would you think I would know that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. But I will tell you, like, this is not a story I think I probably ever told publicly, but the Times Square used to be packed with hookers, um, some very nice looking girls, I'll tell you. And when I was about maybe 22 or something, I was walking downtown to my apartment from way uptown, probably from one of the revival theaters on the Upper West Side where there are a lot of movie theaters. And this friend of mine, this guy and I were walking through Times Square and there was this beautiful girl in the street. And I said, that girl is beautiful. And this guy, Billy, said, you know, these girls, they're mostly gay. He said, I'm sure they're gay. He said, I'm gonna find out. So he went up to her and he said, how much? And she said, you want a party? And he said, how much? And she, he said, $35. And he looked at me and he said, how much for me and my wife? And she said, $70. <laughs> so I said, they can count. Uh, um, <laughs> but these people have, I don't, they're all, they've all disappeared. Hmm. So I'm sure that you, know, you think that Madrid is being ruined by tourists. And I'm sure it is. You know, I'm positive that that's true. You know, every place is ruined by tourists. And no matter where the tourists are from, they want everything to be the same as what they left, but just with kind of a different background. You know, they should stay home and just take pictures of themselves in front of different backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.